So welcome everyone to our second CACR speaker series talk of the year. I'm Joe Tomain, a senior fellow at the CACR and a lecturer at the law school here, Maurer School of Law. We're pleased to have you all here. This is the first of our three talks on cybersecurity and elections. We're very pleased to have Barbara Simons here and I'm going to turn it over to Maureen Biggers to introduce our speaker for today. Maureen is the co-founder and the executive director of IU Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. Maureen. Thank you, Joe, and welcome everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara to you. Barbara has been on the board of advisors of the US Election Assistance Commission since she was appointed in 2008. She published a book, Broken Ballots, Will Your Vote Count? on voting technology, which was co-authored with Douglas Jones. She also co-authored the report that led to the cancellation of the Department of Defense's Internet Voting Project, CERV, in 2004 because of security concerns. Simons is the former president of the Association for Computing Machinery, otherwise known as ACM. It's the oldest and largest international educational and scientific society for computing professionals. She has several honors. She's the only woman to have received the Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award from the College of Engineering at Berkeley, where she earned her PhD in computer science. A fellow of ACM and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, she also received the 2020 ACM Policy Award, the Computing Research Association Distinguished Service Award, the ACM Outstanding Contribution Award, the Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award and the Norbert Weiner Award from Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. She is board chair of Verified Voting and is retired from IBM Research. And something near and dear to my heart, she co-founded and is especially proud of the re-entry program for women and minorities in computer science at Berkeley. This happened some years ago, it was the first of its kind. Uh, the purpose of the program was to create more female and minority PhDs in computer science. She was also on the board of the Coalition to Diversify Computing, a group that works at increasing participation of underrepresented minorities in computer science. I hope she'll address Indiana voting in her talk, but if not, please let's be sure to ask during the Q&A, because I know she has some interesting insights to share. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Simons. Take thank you, Maureen. Uh, thanks, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's quite an introduction. Um, I, uh, it's a pity that we're not all together in a big auditorium for lots of reasons, but in particular, if we were, you could jump in with questions during the talk, but now you have to wait until, until I finish, which is uh, unfortunate. But I am planning to talk about Indiana. Okay. In fact, um, you know what we didn't test was moving slides. Uh, uh, here we go. There we go. So Indiana, um, there's a lot of work that can be done in Indiana. Excuse me, having a problem. This is the first time I've done this. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done in Indiana. So those of you who want to uh, be volunteers, uh, you have, there's a lot you can do. You've got a crazy quilt of polling place, voting technology. I mean, it's, it's really one of the worst states in the country. Sorry guys, but that's the reality. More than half of the state uses paperless voting systems that are insecure and, and really old technology. Uh, one quarter uses handmarked paper ballots, roughly, uh, which is what you want to have. That is what's used in Monroe County, where the university is. So um, that's a good that's the good news. If um, if you want to see more about the type of voting systems that are used in Indiana, here is a link uh, at the Verified Voting website. Basically, we have something called the Verifier, which is a map of the entire country that shows the the voting systems that are used everywhere. By state, you can, you can drill down by state, you could drill down by county, you can get information about the election officers at the state and local levels, and you can even go back to 2006 to see how things have changed. So uh, I guess Indiana is state 18. Um, so with Indiana, again, you've got bad polling place machines. 
you do have mail-in ballots, but you need an excuse to vote absentee. Uh, one of the good things that Indiana will be doing is early, early pre-processing of the ballots. So that means, um, and I'll talk a bit about what that, what that entails, but that basically means that the results are unlikely to be significantly delayed. And we all know that, um, especially in the upcoming election, delayed results could be viewed as controversial. So at least Indiana will, won't, won't be dealing, won't probably, probably will not have to be dealing with that. Indiana will not accept mail-in ballots after election day, independent of when they were postmarked. So even if a mail-in ballot was mailed uh, like 10 days before the election and arrives a day afterwards, it won't be accepted. Indiana also allows some particularly, well, all forms of internet voting are insecure, but Indiana allows email and fax return for overseas military uh, voters. And that is, those are especially insecure. And I'll talk a bit more later about why. So first I wanna talk about how did we get to where we are now um, with the voting technologies that are being deployed. And, and history uh, is again, not very good. Computers were introduced into elections without a proper analysis of the risk. And just to add parenthetically, this is not the first time that we've seen computers being used for something that policymakers think is a good idea when the policymakers don't consult with the experts first before making policy or passing laws. And that's what happened with computers. So the culprit, as is often the case, is Florida. Uh, and those of you who are old enough to remember Florida 2000 undoubtedly remember the hanging and pregnant chads. Uh, there was also an issue with the Florida midterm in 2002. And it was the, the midterm actually that, that gave the kick to getting the legislation passed, which was passed in 2002, the Help America Vote Act. It allocated almost $4 billion for new machines. And um, there were a lot of vendor promises that followed on this act. The vendors promised the machines would be secure. They said you only have to touch a button at the end of the election to get the results, which of course had a lot of appeal for election officials. Uh, I mean, election day is really exhausting for everybody involved and for election officials to be able to go home at the end of the day and not have to worry about anything else I'm sure it sounded great to them. I mean, it would sound great to them now. So that was another attraction of these machines. They claimed that they were federally certified, but again, um, you know, that that's a bit misleading, and I'll talk a bit more about that too. The law had a deadline for spending the money, and as a result of that deadline, there was a gold rush mentality. Uh, and not only were officials eager to spend the money, but they were also eager to be able to claim to their voters that they have the latest and greatest technologies for voting. Uh, these were all the best of intentions, but um, they, they had, um, they, especially the early, the early purchases, many of them were um, not particularly good. And then there were some organizations that represented voters with disabilities that were pushing paperless voting systems uh, on the grounds that uh, if a vote, would, Again, they tended to claim that all voters with disabilities had visual problems, which wasn't true. But uh, the idea that if somebody with a vision, with a visual disability can't, you know, can't see the ballot, then that person's at a disadvantage over someone who can. So basically no one should be able to. Um, computers were used uh, in early voting. <clears throat> the kinds of computers that were used in early voting were um, many of them not, you know, basically not good, and some of them are still in use in Indiana today. So initially, many of these new machines were paperless. They were what's called direct recording electronic, or DREs. That means that the results are directly recorded into the machine, uh, in, into the memory of the machine. They were typically touch screen, although there was also a vendor that produced push button machines. But most of them were touch screen, uh, where the machine would display the vote, record the vote, and tabulate the vote. Uh, and uh, these, these, uh, dis these displays, many of them, needed to be calibrated frequently. And when they weren't, you, you could have effects like the jumping votes. So you've probably all seen videos of people who show, show that they touched a button on the, on the screen for candidate A and candidate B lit up. And uh, many of these people feel that the votes are being stolen. Now, I'm, I actually don't think those votes are being stolen, or at least not intentionally, because if I wanted to steal votes, I wouldn't do it in such an obvious way. 
I think the issue is that these machines are be, that were not recently calibrated or the, it's gone out of calibration. Of course, when you have this kind of situation where a different candidate lights up, it's not clear who will get the vote. Be, and there's no way to check whether either candidate A or candidate B was awarded the vote because there's no way to check what was stored in the memory of the computer. These machines were badly engineered and they cannot be recounted. When they would fail, which happened uh, fairly frequently, or if there were insufficient numbers, they, there could be long lines created, which would in turn uh, disenfranchise voters. So uh, early in the early 2000s, a lot of computer scientists in particular uh, led the charge against these paperless machines because we know that you can't trust the computers. So in response to that, uh, there, uh, the vendors developed what they, well, we called for paper trails at the time, and the vendors retrofitted many of these DRA, DREs. And as I said, there are still some in use in Indiana. Um, and with them, something called voter verified paper audit trails, uh, which was supposed to be hard copy backup of the computer. So even though you're not, you can't be sure of what is stored in the memory of the computer, the idea was you have this hard copy backup and you could always use that as a check. You could do a recount using the hard copy backup. The problem is that like the machines themselves, these voter verified paper audit trails were badly engineered. Uh, they were continuous roll thermal printed, most of them, sort of like a gas receipt. So if you've ever left a gas receipt uh, in, in sunlight for a couple of days, you'll see that it's faded. Sometimes it's hard to read. They typically had small fonts, which again were hard to read, and also often were stored under pla transparent plastic, which increased the difficulty of reading them. There was an MIT study that was done a few years back, which showed that most people didn't check these VPATs, they're called voter verified paper audit trails. And um, in fact, most of them didn't even know that they were intended to validate their votes. So um, testing and certification uh, was also uh, less than desirable. Uh, there still to this day are what's called voluntary voter voter gu voting guidelines, federal guidelines. So there are no mandatory guidelines for voting systems. Although most states adhere to these voluntary guidelines, the early ones had minimal security and accessibility testing, computer scientists, computer security experts are not involved. Many of them were designed the way you might design a testing for say um, a toaster or some other object. You wanna make sure that it can withstand extremities of heat, that if you drop it, it won't break that kind of testing. But for example, there was no penetration testing required. Uh, so so the, the secure, there was really very little consideration of security. The assumption was that these were secure. Um, so a number of states um, had problems, a number of people had problems with this testing. So in 2006, California took the lead with a top to bottom review, which involved many University of California scientists, computer scientists and cybersecurity experts, as well as accessibility, usability experts and even some legal experts. They tested all three, they tested all three of the major systems that were being used in California for security and accessibility and everything failed basically. They were all bad. The question was how bad were they? Uh, the testing, there was subsequent testing done in Ohio, the Everest study in 2007, which not only confirmed all the problems found in California, but it, it found additional new problems. There have since been quite a few studies. I'm not bothering to list them, but um, these, that there have been a number of negative results that have been discovered since these early ones. So jumping ahead to 2020, um, there will be in-person voting in 2020, despite all the discussion of remote voting, of vote by mail. Um, as I'm sure you all know, poll workers tend to be elderly, and because of the risk of COVID-19, many of them are not signing up to be poll workers for this election. So that means that we need to involve many more younger people. So uh, please, if you are a young person, uh, a young healthy person uh, watching this talk and uh, you have the time and the energy, it would be great if you would sign up to be a poll worker. Um, I did that myself in 2004 uh, and it was really an eye opener. Um, uh, well, you do get paid for it. I don't know how much Indiana pays, but poll workers are paid. Uh, I wouldn't do it because you're gonna come back wealthy, but um, you do get a great sense of having done, having contributed to the civic well-being and it, it'll give you a different insight into voting and uh, also probably 
will result in your thanking poll workers in the future. I mean, that's something I always do because I know it's a hard job. Of course, for, for in-person voting, we're gonna need PPEs and sanitizers and sufficient sta spa large space for safe distancing. Uh, one of the encouraging uh, pieces of news has been that a, lot of, a number of sports arenas are being made available throughout the country for voting, which again, provides the kind of space that's needed for secure in-person voting. Um, if, again, if voters are required to vote on machines for in-person voting, if there are an insufficient number or if there are breakdowns, there's a risk um, that voters could be disenfranchised. And this is true for any kind of voting machine, both the old DREs and new ballot marking devices that I'll talk about uh, shortly. So mail-in ballots have also gotten a lot of um, attention recently. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what happens with mail-in ballots. So um, there's pre-processing that has to be done for mail-in ballots. So first of all, the ballots have to be sorted by ballot style. In other words, what municipality or district is the voter voting from? Uh, that information is on the outside of the ballot. Based on that information on the envelope, then the, the person, then the election official or the poll worker, whoever's doing this work, looks up the voter's information on a voter registration database and does a signature. It actually wouldn't be a poll worker, uh, an, an employee of election official in, in the election office. They do a signature comparison using the database, uh, voter registration database. Um, if the signature matches, then the envelope is accepted and the voter marked as having voted in the voter registration database. If it's missing, and that's a problem with a number of mail-in ballots that, that people forget to sign them, or if the signatures don't match, signature doesn't match, then there are two possible options. The better one, of course, is to inform the voter in time and allow the voter the, the opportunity to fix the problem. Uh, that's called curing. Um, not all states provide this option. And of course, this option is not possible if the processing starts very late, say around November 2nd or 3rd. Now, the, um, there, there are two different ways in which mail-in ballots can be sent in. In California, where I live, we have an inner envelope and an outer envelope. So, so you put your ballot in the inner envelope and that has no personal information whatsoever. So it's completely anonymous. The inner envelope is put in an outer envelope, which has all your information, your name, your signature, and so on. Um, and that's what's mailed. Uh, some, some states don't do that. They have an outer, they just have one envelope. And um, that envelope will have all of the information, but presumably it can be easily torn off the envelope. And then the envelope without the voter information is, is what's then saved. So in either case, you have to have a version of the ballot with no voter information, which is saved for county. Um, some states allow early ballot tab tabulation. Uh, when that happens, the results must be kept confidential because uh, otherwise they could be used to influence the election. Uh, early pre-processing, such as is done in Indiana, can speed up the results, but it's not allowed in some states. State, there are states now that are encouraging mail-in ballots. So, um, for example, there's the states that already do primarily mail-in voting, such as uh, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, Hawaii, and Washington. In those states, the mail-in voting should run relatively smoothly. Uh, there are states that have sent vote by mail request forms to all voters and had in-person voting, but some of them lack early pre-processing while, um, while others are gonna be doing early pre-processing. Um, those states which lack the early pre-processing could have major delays in tabulations. That includes Iowa, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And I mention that just because it's reasonably to reasonable to expect that when states have not produced all their results, there may be some contention uh, in this election. Vermont is mailing ballots to every voter, but is not planning to pre-process, pre is, no, is doing no pre-processing. It's not going to start processing the ballots until November 2nd, which means that the um, results will, the determination of the results will likely be delayed. Some states allow late ballot arrival, even if the ballot, assuming the ballots are postmarked by election day. Uh, California, I think, may be the outlier. We allow ballots to arrive as much as 17 days after election day, which is why you often hear about the results haven't yet come in from California, the final results, because we're still counting. Um, other states require ballots to receive by election day. Indiana's one such state. Uh, so there are potential issues with vote by mail or early voting or remote voting or whatever you want to call it. Clearly, it's going to, there's a significant increase in 2020 because of the pandemic. And this could be a problem for states that normally have little remote voting. 
Uh, and then there can be other reasons for delays as well. So for example, in Pennsylvania, there, there, are, delays, there are some delays that are being caused by lawsuits. Uh, in June, the Republican Party uh, 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 created a lawsuit uh, against the new drop boxes that were gonna be put around in various locations in Pennsylvania. Um, in September 17th, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court rule that um, those drop boxes are okay, plus um, ballots postmarked uh, at least up to three days, postmarked by election day, but arriving up to three days late could be counted. Uh, however, just a few days ago on September 22nd, the Pennsylvania Republican Party announced it will appeal that decision to the Supreme Court. I think they're appealing only the late arrival acceptance part of it. Uh, but in any case, uh, when you have court, court cases so close to the election, it's clearly going to cause some confusion for voters and also create problems potentially for election officials. So another problem with remote voting with, with vote by mail is that blank ballots may not be received in time. So the blank ballots may not be received in a timely fashion by the voter and the voter ballot may not be returned in a timely fashion. So it may not arrive prior to election day. So uh, what, there are problems with the postal service, as we know, and the post office doesn't post my prepaid mail, which many of these uh, mail-in ballots are sent in, but it can provide evidence of when um, the ballot was sent, when, when the piece of mail was sent. Um, there are other potential problems with vote by mail because of this big surge in demand. Um, there, there could be supply chain issues. There have, as I mentioned, there have been court, court issues court delays, insufficient number of workers because of COVID-19 and so on. So on election day, the um, envelope of the ballot is open, the ballot is prepared for scanning. If it can't be read by the tabulating scanner, and again, essentially all paper ballots are, are, are tabulated by scanners. Uh, and uh, for um, mail-in ballots, they tend to be tabulated by high-speed scanners. So the ballot has to be remade if it can't be read by the scanners. That means copied by hand. And I'm sure you can think of obvious issues with that where, where people could make mistakes, uh, most likely uh, just genuine mistakes, but it could, some could be intentional, you don't know. Uh, obviously, there has to be a lot of oversight of this copying. It's also time, very time consuming, which is another issue. The ballots are flattened put, and put into batch for this high-speed scanning, and then the, 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 they're scanned and counted. Um, if you want more details about what's happening at the state-by-state -state level, there's an article which was just published by Andrew Appel in Freedom to Tinker uh, that, that goes into more detail at the state level of, um, of how these mail-in ballots are being processed. So as I said, scanners count almost all paper ballots, both in-person voting, where typically you will, if it's a hand-marked paper ballot, you will insert it into the scanner at the polling place, although there are some states, I believe Ohio is still one, where the ballots are collected in the polling place and then scanned at a central location using high-speed scanners. And again, the scan, these scanners are all computers, just like the voting machines are all computers. And therefore they are subject to the vulnerabilities of computers, including software bugs and hacks. So there are a couple of myths about election security that really bug me, um, that are promulgated by people who know better. One is that machines are never connected to the internet so they can't be hacked. Well, it's true that voting machines in most cases, there are actually some exceptions, but by and large, they're not connected to the internet. But for each election, you have to program the voting machine and, and or the scanner with information about that election. You have to tell it who the candidates are, what their locations are on the ballot, and so on. That programming is done by a different computer. And then, and then that information is, is transferred to the machines or the scanners viable via a portable memory device. So these computers that do the programming typically are connected at some time to the internet and they could become infected. Then they could in turn infect the voting machine or scanner. By the way, another way in which, a scan, in which machines and scanners could be infected is if some, someone working in, in the polling in the election office uh, if that person's computer is infected and then that person communicates with other people who get this, get the, somehow get the virus onto the scanner via various forms of communication. And an example of where this happened, where the system wasn't connected to the internet, but it was still hacked is this, is 
what happened to the Iranian centrifuges where the Stuxnet virus brought them down. It made them crash. Now, the Iranian centrifuges were never connected to the internet, and, but the virus somehow infected them anyway, and this was clearly done via some computers that were connected to the internet. The second myth is that there's so many different types of systems that it's impossible to rig an election. And I'm amazed that anybody says this because anyone who understands the Electoral College knows that you don't need to attack everything. You don't have to rig the, an entire election. All you have to do is focus on a few key swing states. And you don't even have to focus on the entire state. Basically, all you have to focus on is a small number of swing, pre, of swing precincts in swing states. And especially in a close election, that should be enough to swing it. So we do have a solution. That's the good news. The solution is voter mark paper ballots, ideally hand marked, a strong chain of custody, and statistically sound manual post election ballot audits called risk limiting audits. So the voter mark paper ballot systems, um, the voter marked, basically the hand marked is the voter manually marks the ballot. The ballots are typically counted by scanners, uh, no, normally at the polling place if it's a polling place voting. If there are long lines at the polling place and you've got voter marked paper ballots um, that you don't need a machine for, uh, the voter can mark the ballot and deposit it in a ballot box for later scanning. So in particular, if there's a line for the scanners or if there are other issues, if the voter can get her ballot, mark it and deposit and leave. Now there are some new, ballot, new machines called ballot marking devices, which have become somewhat contentious. They're, they're sort of, a, you can view them kind of like replacements of the DREs, except they produce uh, paper ballots. They are quite expensive, much more expensive than hand-marked paper ballots. And most of them print only the voters' selection on paper ballots. So it'll list the, the races you voted for and your selections, for, it'll list your selections for various races, but it won't list uh, races where you didn't vote, um, which could be a problem if uh, voters forget to vote for certain races. So Los Angeles, which is the largest uh, voting area in the country, by the way, um, they have produced their own ballot marking device and that lists every race uh, when, you know, on the printout. And if you haven't voted, it says no selection. There's also another a ballot marking device, which I think is, is, is quite good as, as an ideal, which prints out a copy of the ballot itself, not just your summary, but the whole ballot, and marks it as if it were hand marked. And a nice thing about this particular machine, and I forget which vendor produces it, but I can get you that information if you're curious, uh, is that if, if it's used by, by voters with disabilities, it's hard to distinguish the ballots that are produced from ballots that are hand marked by voters who don't have visual impairments. Now, parts of some states, including uh, Indiana and Georgia, and all of Georgia, all polling place voters must vote on ballot marking devices. Now, these machines are supposed to be accessible for voters with disabilities. I put accessible in, in, accessible in quotation marks because some of them are maybe there are accessibility issues. Um, but in any case, with these machines, because the ballots are printed by the machine, the voter needs to check the ballot because the ballot is the voter's selection. And again, as we saw with these DREs and with the voter verified paper audit trail, voters tend to trust printouts and they shouldn't because again, voting machines are computers. They could be hacked. They could have software bugs. So there have been some early results that, that suggest that voters don't check the printouts. And so one question, and anybody who's interested in usability, uh, I hope will look into this and see if you can come up with some good solutions, is how to get the voter to check, to check their ballots before they deposit them in the ballot box. There are also some bad ballot marking device designs. So um, the ESS, ESNS Express Vote uh, has what uh, Andrew Appel uh, declared permission to cheat because it gives voters the option of not viewing their ballots um, their ballots before they are, I, I should say, these machines, um, oops, sorry. These machines have the scanner inside the machine. So 
if you don't, so you can say, I don't need to look at my ballot, and then the, 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 scan, the ballot will be sucked back into the machine without your looking at it. And if you've got a virus, on, a smart virus on this machine, it could, in theory, change your vote. And these machines are used in uh, a number of counties in, Indi in Indiana, which I've listed there. Um, as I say, they could print different selection on the ballot if you don't check. So it's really, really critical in those counties I've listed for voters to check that their ballots are correctly printed. Uh, another type of bad ballot marking device is the Dominion ImageCast Evolution. Um, it, it also has the scanner inside the machine. And what it does is after the ballot has been displayed, it sucks the ballot back into the machine on a path that goes pa back underneath the scanner. And because it goes underneath the scanner for a second time, the scanner could in theory add or change, add votes to the ballot by uh, creating overvotes and just and making some, making a voter selection not legal, or voting in elections where the voter didn't cast a vote. So this is also a very bad design. Now the post-election ballot audits um, look for the post-election ballot audit. You want to start with preliminary results that are reported before the audits are done because the whole idea of a post-election ballot audit is to check on these results to see if they're correct or not. So the audit must be completed before the certification of the results, because otherwise, if you find a problem, um, you might not be able to fix it if the results have already been certified. So that's sort of a no brainer, but, but believe me, it's an issue. Um, these audits have to be done manually because we, again, remember there are checks on the computers and we don't, we're not, we're not trusting the computers. We, we want to have a manual count eye to eye done by human beings of these ballots. The ballot should be randomly selected. You can think of this a little bit um, with the random selection sort of like, or, well, certainly with, with the good risk limiting audits, you can think of them as kind of like um, exit polls, except you are querying the ballots and not people. So risk limiting audits uh, are the gold standard of post-election ballot audits. They are recommended by the Presidential Commission on Election Administration the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report and the Senate Intelligence Committee. And they were developed by UC Berkeley, Professor Philip Stark. Uh, and that's what we are trying to get implemented in as many places as possible. So again, they are a check on the computers that tabulate the vote to determine if the reported outcomes are correct by manually sampling, by manually examining a sample of ballots. And a risk limited audit guarantees a pre-specified chance a large pre-specified chance that will correct a wrong reported outcome, wrongly reported outcome. Um, it, so uh, the idea is if the outcome report is wrong, if it disagrees with the, it is wrong, it is wrong because it, a different outcome would have been obtained by full manual recount. The largest chance that a wrong outcome will not be corrected by a risk limiting audit is the risk limit itself. So the risk limit for example, if you've got a risk limiting audit of 10%, that means that if the outcome is wrong, there is at least a 90% chance, at least, that the audit will lead to a full manual count recount. In other words, the way the audit works is if it starts finding problems, if it finds too many problems, it looks at more ballots. And, and then it keeps on looking at more ballots if there are problems until either you can, make, you can statistically show that the outcome is almost certainly correct or you've had a full manual recount. So, um, so one of the things that I've been working on and that my organization Verified Voting has been working on is trying to get risk limiting audits implemented in as many parts of the country as possible because these risk limiting audits are our protection against attacks on voting machines and scanners. So this is the way that we can make sure that the outcome, that the tabulation of the results is, are correct, the tabulations are correct. So we, there are state laws that require risk limiting audits. Colorado was the first, and they started with the 2018 midterm. Of course, they're going to be doing uh, one again in November. Rhode Island passed a law, so and so did Georgia, and they'll both be doing their first, first risk limiting audits in November, this November. Michigan and Pennsylvania, which of course are major states, are likely to do them, but it's not definite. The reason I say likely is the secretaries of state in both states want to do them, but they don't have the authority to order them. Uh, and in both states, again, there have been 
pilot risk limiting audits conducted earlier. So election officials know how they work, they're comfortable with them. Uh, it's much easier to implement them on a larger scale if you've done pilots. So uh, that's one of the things that we've also been doing is many pilot risk limiting audits. Well, you do it on a real election, but it, you know, it's, it's done after the results have been declared so people are more relaxed. Even if these states don't succeed in conducting risk limiting audits, although we think, especially in Michigan, it's quite likely that it will, but even if they don't, it's likely they will conduct decent audits because they know how to do audits and they have uh, election officials who are really keen on doing them. Virginia has a law, but it's, it's a very bizarre law because the audit is unlikely to be conducted before the recount deadline. So um, uh, I think that was an example of a political compromise, that law. Arizona is hoping to have a risk limiting audit conducted in every county and we'll see, hopefully that'll happen. And just to reassure people, most the most likely tipping point states will have reasonable audit laws even if they don't have risk limiting audits. An example is Florida. Florida has terrible recount laws uh, which are limited and they only do rescans. They only put the ballots through the scanners again, which isn't a recount if there's a problem with the scanner. Uh, Florida drafted some really terrible laws after Florida 2000. It's like they don't want to ever do a recount again. Uh, what we should not do is internet voting, including cell phone and blockchain voting. And this is a slide, if, again, if this were a live audience, well, it is a live audience, but if this were an audience that could yell back at me, um, I would ask you, what do these um, entities all have in common? And hopefully you would all yell back in unison, they've all been hacked. Uh, this is an old slide, so uh, I could have added a lot more names to it, but as you can see, there's not a lot of space. So stating the obvious, how can underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced local election officials, and by the way, we do not spend enough money on our elections, that's another issue. And, and, and local election officials sometimes work under really difficult conditions. They don't have enough resources. But how can they, with, they, have, they tend to have little to no proficiency available or computer security expertise. How can they protect their servers in an internet-based election from well-financed adversaries such as foreign countries, political operatives, and rogue hackers? Uh, we know there are poss possible nation states at state attacks. The Senate Intelligence Committee report talked about, and by the way, there was a bipartisan report issued in August 2018 about Russian interference in the 2016 election. And as you can see, um, it was quite extensive according to the Senate Intelligence Committee. We have no evidence of votes having been changed in 2016. But we, there's no way to know for sure because there wasn't the proper accounting done afterwards. I mean, we, on the way we run elections, they would be, there would be major problems. We do not do the proper accounting that needs to be done with our elections. And that's been the case for a very long time and certainly since computers have been involved. And that's why it's so critically important to try to get these risk limiting audits implemented throughout the country. We know that many countries are capable of attacks and here are a few that are listed. It's not only Russia who could attack us and some of these other countries have in other situations such as the Sony movie, which was Sony was attacked by North Korea. So what is internet voting? Internet voting is the returning of a voted ballot over the internet. So a blank ballot going over the internet is not considered internet voting. It's the returning of a voted ballot that is. This can be done by a web, an email attachment, or a fax. <clears throat> an email voting, which is done in Indiana, is perhaps even more dangerous than web-based because emails can be modified en route. You can have lost ballots. You can, there is no secret ballot. Uh, you can have ballot box stuffing because you can forge headers on e emails. You can, have count, you can have counterfeit ballots and so on. Um, and I don't know if this is still the case, but certainly at least a few years ago, there was some confusion among some election officials that email voting is really internet voting. We, there were election officials who claimed it's not. But of course, email goes over the internet. So by definition, it's internet voting. You can vote on your personal computer, smartphone, a smart tablet, and so on. There is ongoing research using cryptography to try to come up with secure ways of doing internet voting. But at the moment, prominent, very prominent cryptographers, including one who developed his own uh, internet voting system, oppose the implementation of internet voting 
for the foreseeable future in any kind of major election. In, nonetheless, internet voting is used in the United States in about 30 states, which allow military and overseas voters to return ba voted ballots over the internet. There also were some pilot, in quotation marks, real elections conducted in 2020 where um, everybody in the particular uh, area could vote, not limited to military voters. Of course, the people running the elections claim they were secure, but it's impossible to know. And just, I would just add parenthetically, when you hear people talking about doing a pilot study, something like internet voting, the obvious question is, why would any serious opponent hack a pilot election? I mean, if I want to hack an American election, I'm going to wait until people are foolish enough to trust an insecure system and then start using it on a major election. That's when I'm going to hack it. I'm not going to touch the pilot. Let them think it's, it's okay. Um, so the MOVE Act was passed in 2009 as a way of providing secure voting for military overseas that doesn't require the return of voted ballots. Um, and it does this by eliminating the delay of mailing a blank ballot to the voters. So, so the MOVE Act requires states to provide blank ballots at least 45 days before an election. The voter should download the, the ballot, print it, mark it, and return it via postal mail, not over the internet. And there's expedited, expedited Postal mail, postal mail return of voted ballots for the military. So they can get them back very fast. So um, they, have, they have special mailings for doing that. So you'll often hear that we need internet voting because uh, mili our overseas military uh, can't cast their vote in time. Uh, obviously there's some people who won't be able to, but by and large, this is a non-issue. And uh, you'll also hear and this is something which has been, uh, especially recently, one's been hearing this, uh, that internet voting will increase voter participation in general. Now, this is a belief that many people have without evidence. There was a major British Columbia study done in 2014. They spent $400,000 on it, and it showed that internet voting does not increase voter participation in general or even by young people, which was a big surprise because they were anticipating that young people would be voting a lot over the internet. What they found was instead, the people who used the internet were likely to vote anyway. And there were similar results from Estonia and Switzerland. So basically, uh, I, I'm gonna go through these last slides quickly so there's time for questions. Um, there are no regulations for internet voting, there are none. And the National, Institute's, National Institute for Standards and Technology was asked to develop standards. They produced reports, but no standards because they said with the, with the technology we have today, it is impossible to create a standard. The vulnerabilities, um, those of you who know cybersecurity, this is, you know, this is something you can say in your sleep. There are issues of authenticating the voter. You can have malware on the voter's device that can change the voter's votes without the voter's knowledge or describe the vote, the vote altogether. And something that I think a lot of people don't realize is that what you see on the screen of your computer or your smartphone may not be what's sent out over the internet. You can have a denial of service attack that can prevent real ballots from reaching election officials penetration attacks on the voter service, the, on the vote servers, the election official servers that can change the votes. These, ballot, these votes cannot be audited because you can't be certain that the votes were accurately recorded in the first place. There's a risk of um, secret ballots being exposed. You can have vote buying and selling and voter coercion. Now, something called mobile voting is being, has been pushed recently it's by, by Tusk Philanthropies in particular. The idea is to use smartphone voting, smartphones uh, they, they call it mobile voting because internet voting has been given a bad name and that they want is people voting on their smartphones, but of course smartphones communicate over the internet. So it is internet voting. And there are two major vendors, Democracy Live and Votes. Uh, both have been shown to have security vulnerabilities by independent cybersecurity experts. Neither is federally tested or certified in any way. They've never been used in mock elections, which allow anyone to hack. Now, just parenthetically, there was such a mock election in 2010 in Washington, D.C. for internet voting where anybody from anywhere was allowed to hack into the, into the internet voting system, which the election officials were completely convinced was secure. Within, I think, 36 hours, a team from the University of Michigan had total control, total control over that election. They could not only change all of these, these were fake votes because it was a mock election, they could change all the votes that had been already um, voted and those that were going to come in in the future. And they left a calling card, which is the, uh, the uh, marching song for the University of Michigan. Uh, although it even, even so, it took the election officials a while to discover that the system had been hacked. So 
both of these, uh, these mobile voting vendors have had their systems used in real pilot elections, real elections where the votes counted. Um, so um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Just want to mention that votes, one of their claims for fame is that they claim they have blockchain voting and that somehow using the word blockchain makes their system secure. Now, I just want to point out that blockchains are, are simply a data, a way of storing information and they don't, uh, they, they really have little to nothing to do with the security aspects of voting. And this was confirmed by the National Academies of Science report, which said specifically that blockchain methods do not redress security issues with internet voting. So I think I'll stop there. If you want more information again about the types of voting systems used throughout the country, there is this map, the verifier map on the verified voting website that um, you can go to and find it. So there we are. So thank you very much, Barbara. And we had a couple questions come in that I'm gonna share with you right now. And then for other folks who wanna ask questions, if you wanna either raise your blue hand or if you would like to send one to the chat, I can share those as well. So let me just start with the, the first two that we have. So the first question there, and I'm not sure if you're this familiar with Indiana law, uh, whether Indiana law allows pre-processing of absentee ballots. The person who asked the question said that the League of Women Voters had a Q&A with our local election board on Tuesday, and they were quite clear that the dead voter law means no pre-processing. Well, that's interesting because I took that information from Andrew Pell's paper. Uh, so um, I guess if I had to, although I normally trust Andrew Pell, I would trust the League of Women Voters from Indiana even more. So um, that, he's probably wrong on that. Okay, thank you. And then the next one that came in already, what is standing in the way of establishing a standard for voting machines to certify them to be allowed to be bought for election use? ASTM could help set up the standardization process. That's a really good question. And um, I think there should be, I think there should be standardization. Uh, I would, um, I think a lot of this is politics. Uh, you know, elections, we all know are highly political uh, issue. Um, uh, I mean, even the, the federal standards that we have are not mandatory. So I guess, I guess, you know, this organization could create their own standards and maybe that would be a good idea. Maybe that's something we should talk about afterwards. But even if they are created, it would be very difficult to make them mandatory because states ultimately have control over their elections, certainly at the state level. The federal level, the, fed, the feds can have some say, and that's why the Help America Vote Act was passed and some early, you know, Voting Rights Act was passed. But um, by and large, there's a lot of pushback to somebody coming in and telling the state how to run its election. But I think that would be a good idea. So uh, whoever posted that, uh, you know, I'd love to uh, talk to him or her afterwards. Great, and uh, we have another question that came in that I'll, I'll read, and before I do that, we also had a question if you'd be willing to share your slides. Oh yeah, I, I, you guys are gonna have them, right? I don't think I have them, but we'll talk after we end the oh, yeah. conversation. Sure. And I'll try to post them uh, with the video that we are going to post for this discussion. Sure, sure. sure. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. And so the next question is, what resources would you suggest we share with state and local policymakers to help them understand the security issues associated with online voting systems? How can citizens advocate for better policies? Oh, my. There's a lot of material that's been developed. Um, about uh, online voting. Um, there's actually, uh, of course, this is something that, that we wrote about in our book. Um, again, you know, here's an idea. Why don't, I mean, there, there's so many articles and there's so much research that's been done that shows how bad it is. Uh, perhaps I could provide that information to you later and you could post it. I, so yeah. I'll provide a number of references so that people would be able to use, access those references. So that would be good. Thank you. And the person who asked the question said that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. And if that person wants to contact me directly, that would be fine too. You can give them my email address. Okay. Other questions? You can raise your blue hand or pro post one in chat. Gee, there's usually tons of questions. 
Um, well, here's a question. Uh, is anybody out there working as a poll worker in November? Anyone planning to do that? Can people respond? Uh, at, least, at least one person raised their hand and I, I've got to so I maybe have a couple more questions. So this next one comes from uh, Lori McRobbie and asks if you could speak to the security of electronically held voter rolls. Ah. So the voter registration databases uh, are, of course, another issue. Um, we know, for example, in 2016, that a company called VR, which is in Florida, was hacked by, I believe, by the Russians. And they make these voter registration databases uh, and their systems are used in many parts of the country. In particular, we know that their system was used in Durham, North Carolina. So those of you who remember the 2016 election may recall that Durham, North Carolina, which was a democratic stronghold, had major problems on election day. Uh, they couldn't get things started. There were long lines and so on. And a number of election integrity people wanted to be able to look at that database to see if it had been hacked. Because at the time, we didn't know that the vendor had been hacked, but subsequently we learned that. Um, and I won't go, I mean, for political reasons, it didn't happen. Um, and uh, I think that was a, a lost opportunity because one question that we often get asked is, can you give any examples of something that was hacked? Now, I don't know that the Durham voter registration database was hacked or that the system that uses it was hacked. Um, we don't know that it wasn't, but we should be able to find out. And there shouldn't be so many obstacles to going back and checking, but there are, and there are a lot of them. Uh, so um, in general, these voter registration databases um, are not online. And when you go online to make a change on your voter registration, that should be separate from the database itself. And, uh, and then your information should be fed into the database by uh, an election official. Uh, so that's typically the way it should be done. Even so, as we know, lots of things have been hacked. And so these also are vulnerable. Hopefully they're well protected and good security systems are being used. There should be backups and there should also be ideally at the polling place, paper backups where that makes sense. So uh, because so if on election day you have problem accessing the voter registration database, you have paper backup. Uh, there are complications if you have voting centers where people can come from different places. Um, so this is actually a, a hard problem. Uh, I don't, again, uh, the VR, VR is an interesting example. Um, hopefully, and I believe this is the case that election officials do consider these voter registration databases to be very important to make as secure as possible. And I trust that that's what they're doing. But you know, with any computers, there are always issues. So a couple comments and then I'll go on to a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one person uh, responding to your question, is anybody gonna serve as a, uh, the, uh, the election? She wrote, I'm signing up to be a poll worker because of this webinar. Thank you for sharing the information. Uh, that's another, great. another person that's wrote, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying thank you. Uh, another person wrote that they have a few family members working the polls, including a first time voter. Um, and so it looks like we have a person, uh, Jameson Farrell, who has his hand up. Jameson, do you want to ask your question? You should be able to unmute now, Jameson. Maybe having a, a technical difficulty here. Let me ask uh, Shay Feltner. Um, can you ask your question? Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Simons. I had a question regarding about uh, with absentee ballots and things on um, data uh, reproduction. Um, I was kind of interested earlier about your discussion about auditing in Virginia. So when I looked online and I checked my voter registration, it does show when uh, I can when ballots are received or anything else on there. I didn't know if there's any either, if it's a state by state issue or any other federal initiatives for us to be able to go back and maybe query or pro like to query and ensure that absentee ballots are whatever we voted for. I I'm sorry, I'm not very much familiar on that. Uh, you're asking, you wanna know, I'm sorry, do you wanna be able to track your ballot in the mail or uh, I'm not, I don't quite understand your question. 
sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm just saying like, okay, if for say for example, this year, yeah. uh, once I, once that ballot is on there, is there any way I can maybe check my ballot, make sure, Hey, I, this is who I voted for. And uh, just to confirm that stuff, because in Virginia, when like for last year, we don't receive any kind of uh, receipts as, as soon as we put in our ballot. We don't like confirmation that yes, you did it on this or who you voted for. Well, it's not going to tell you who you voted for because it's a secret ballot. So you can't get that. But um, if you mail it, you can track it th uh, through the mail, I believe. Um, so you can see that it's been, it's gotten to its destination. Um, checking that your ballot was actually literally received and counted. Um, that's something that's, that, that's difficult to do. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. But remember, you're not, you, you, you can't expect to get confirmation uh, under the current systems of who you voted for because we have to have secret ballot. Now, again, there are some, some cryptographers who are working on trying to develop systems which would provide that, where you can check that your ballot, ballot was received and that your vote was accurately recorded without your being able to show anybody else how you voted because it's a secret ballot. Um, it's a hard problem. And even systems that have been developed, uh, as I say, uh, one system is called Helios. It was developed by Benedita, a student of Ron Vest, for those of you who know computer scientists. And uh, Ben, even though he developed a system, says it shouldn't be used for critical elections. It shouldn't be used for government elections. Uh, you know, it can be used for elections that aren't so important or where you don't have a secret ballot. So it's the secret ballot that makes it so hard. Uh, I mean, for example, there are, I know there are um, stock elections frequently where it's not a secret ballot. And there, it should be easier to do internet voting if you post the information online so everybody can check. So the secret ballot is what makes voting such a hard problem. Uh, and then we have a comment from Vaughn. Barbara, thank you very much for this great talk. Uh, just a quick comment. You mentioned Monroe County still having paper ballots. And I just wanted to acknowledge and credit that's not due to luck, but due to a number of prescient people here in the county, including uh, former Bloomington Mayor Tom Alia Allison. So we really do have a, a thanks to give those folks for, for seeing some of what you've described here coming. I'm not surprised actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, in fact, I went back and looked at, at Indiana in the early years, and it looks as if there were more handmarked paper ballots back in like 2006 than today because that was before people were going out and buying these machines. So, um, you know, you guys have your work to do to get back to where you used to be. So uh, before we do our last question, and I, and I turn it over to Maureen to close us out, I just wanted to share with everybody the next two talks, both on election security. On October 15th, we have Jens David Olin from Cornell University. Uh, he has a book that just came out this summer called Election Interference international law and the future of democracy. That's on October 15th. The next one is November 5th, 2020 with Duncan Hollis, also gonna be on election security. So we've got a really nice lineup that Barbara started us off with. And your last question is a very easy one for Maureen Bigger. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, after I read the question. Maureen wants to know, what do you think will happen with the presidential election this year? Uh, it's gonna be a mess. I had to ask it. <laughs> I think, I mean, it, I, yeah, it, uh, nobody should expect any results on election night, obviously. And I think uh, even a week out after the election, it's quite possible we won't know for sure who the winner is because of all these mail-in ballots and the fact that many states uh, are not going to be able to count them quickly because they're not accustomed to having so many. So uh, it, it, it kind of, I guess it depends on what happens with, um, well, I guess it depends on, on how long it takes to get up to 270, but even a week out, it still might be unknown. And I can imagine a lot of contention. I'm sure everybody is worried about that. Maureen, any final words here? I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today, Barbara. And we had several people who asked for uh, the slides and a copy of the recording. So we'll be making those available. And okay. uh, just one thing in closing to everyone on the call, if you haven't affiliated with the Center of Excellence for Women and Technology, we would love to have you do that. You just go to our website and um, it's for men and women from all disciplines on campus. Well, so thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, 
Thank you, Maureen and the center for co-hosting this event. Thank you, Barbara Simons, for taking time out of your day. And thank you all for coming. It's been a really wonderful uh, lesson. So thank you so much. Thank you.